Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming. I anticipate we'll probably have some folks kind of wandering in as we go. Like I said, it's kind of difficult uh, sometimes to find parking here. Sometimes it's completely empty and you get in right away, and then the other times you're like, I don't know where to park and I'm not sure where I'm going. So I appreciate you guys making it, especially on a rescheduled day. Um, we just felt that the last meeting, the, the weather was just miserable and today is beautiful. So I hope you enjoyed your sunny trip over here. Um, so as far as any of these, the welcome reports and opportunities, I just wanted to highlight that we did hold our eighth annual spotlight event. Um, the programs are actually over there if you weren't able to attend, if you want to check out one of the programs to see kind of all that was highlighted. But just to give you guys an idea, we did include um, three different programs here locally that are kind of feed into the mission of the AOD partnership to help you know, really reduce this burden of uh, substance abuse. So we're able to feature Randland Homes, uh, Mosaic, the new Mosaic initiative, as well as um, Rise Up, which is the new art-based recovery initiative. Uh, it was really great. We had five wonderful award recipients um, and we also had some, some music that was provided through um, one of the local recoveries to uh, help share a little bit of joy with us. So it was a great event. Um, if you, can't make, if you had, did, weren't able to make it, you know, I just encourage you to, to attend one of those events in the future. Um, pretty much all the feedback I got back is people left with hope, which is really a good feeling, I think, for everybody involved. So um, I have not closed the partner survey yet, so if you have not completed the partner survey, please do so. Um, it is important to us. It is very uh, critical to funding for people to understand or, or for us to be able to, to talk about how people uh, benefit from the AOD partnership, what kind of things you'd like to see happen, uh, what kind of things you'd like to see changed. Um, that's really helpful to us. So I will probably put one last call out in the update this week. So if you haven't taken it, please take you know a couple minutes just to fill it out. It's pretty easy um, to do that. The YRBS reports, we've talked about these a couple times. We actually highlighted them in our February meeting. The Youth Risk Behavior Survey is um, a new data set of all of our public high schools. That's right here in the, shown right here in the middle. Um, they are available online. I do have hard copies over there of the middle school and high school reports. So you can surely go and grab you know, as many as you want. We have a ton you know, back at the office. And just to kind of sum up from last meeting, um, all of our meetings are recorded for YouTube for those of you that are new to these meetings. Um, you have the link on the back side of your agenda. You have the kind of summary that I have up on the screen right now. At the bottom is the video link. So if you go to our YouTube channel, you can view and learn more about all of these. Uh, the Life Report, the YRBS Report, Healthy Marathon County Pulse. Uh, Jenna, who is here in the room, shared a little bit more about Jewel, which I was at a high school this morning, and that was one of the things that was really one of the top things that they were talking about um, kids doing there. And it looks just like a USB drive, so you wouldn't even maybe know it if you saw it. Um, so if you're interested, um, definitely check out that meeting, re the meeting recording, as well as we also welcomed in the CART team, the Crisis Assessment and Response Team to talk a little bit about what they're doing in the community. So we're pretty excited that we're able to, to bring all those folks in the same area. We're really excited to have you here to talk about um, you know, prescription drug abuse today. And again, you know, the weather definitely worked well with us this time. So the last kind of the report update opportunity that I wanted to highlight is uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, Marathon County and Central Wisconsin have about 75 people trained as recovery coaches. Um, that is through CCAR, which is the Connecticut Comprehensive Recovery or Addiction and Recovery Center. Getting it, Ron. <laughs> Ron's one of our CCAR coaches. Um, went through the first training. I think that, just looking around the room, Ginny is one, uh, myself. Uh, essentially what a CCAR recovery coach is or what it can do you know, for you and for your agencies or organizations is to help link an individual either new to recovery, looking for recovery, to the different services that are in the community, help provide a positive social support for that individual, um, and then just really you know, be there to listen. And from my perspective, you know, this is one of those things that really helps fill that gap between traditional, traditional AA, NA, um, traditional sponsorship and licensed counselors. It's, it's someone to really just be there to walk beside that individual. 
If you want to know more or you want to contact uh, the recovery coaches, uh, there is a Facebook page, and we're also going to be partnering with United Way 211 uh, to help manage some of those referrals starting May 1st, otherwise known as tomorrow. Um, so on this page, you'll find you will find different resources. Um, we post different articles that maybe don't end up in the weekly updates. It shows how to, you can actually contact or send a message here to request a, a recovery coach or if you want more information. Um, we're working on the promotional material, so I don't have anything with us today, uh, but it is something that once it's available, you know, we'll definitely be sharing. It will be available by our June meeting here um, on June 5th. Uh, but it is a, a page that is a public page. You surely can like it, share it. Um, it's just something that you know, I just encourage you to do. And if you find anything that you think would be beneficial to post to it, please go ahead and share that with me as well, and I'd be happy to, to post it. And one other thing, too, I have to give kudos to Ginny. Ginny took all of the recovery support meetings, so AA, NA, Al-Anon, Naranon, um, celebrate smart recovery every of every one of those type of meetings in all of central Wisconsin so you're looking at Marathon Lincoln Langley Taylor Clark Portage Wood it was quite an experience I'm sure but essentially as you can see here is that there's recovery support meetings that are taking place all over the place so if you do click into one of these let's say you know I'm looking for a meeting on Thursday 9 a.m. here you have in Marathon County, it tells you the location, where it is, and then you have you know a little bit more of a description, whether it's open, closed, you get everything you possibly want, plus what's great is you have the links to the actual websites, their actual websites. So if things change, you can always confirm things there. They usually keep that stuff up to date. Um, also, when you look at places like Mosaic, which is something that I'll talk about a little bit, um, just a little bit, I'll show you their Facebook page, Mosaic is one of the new initiatives. It's really meant to be kind of a recovery community center uh, from 9 to noon on a daily, Monday through Friday, excuse me, basis at Emmanuel Lutheran. Um, you know, there's going to be recovery coaches potentially could be accessed through there. Uh, it's just a place to kind of go hang out and, and just a really positive, supportive environment. So there's a ton of information on here. I invite you to play around with it. We haven't sent this out yet, but it will be getting sent out uh, because it's just too valuable not to. I gotta tell you, Melissa, that uh, resource guide that's yes. on the website mm -hmm. is probably as comprehensive as I've ever seen. Pulling all the resources together, Jenny. so I, I credit I Jenny. I give her a lot of kudos on that. That's, uh, uh, I mean, just to go through it, uh, you have to take some time just to see all the resources right. that, that are available. So, right. Uh, and that's available, is, is that available just to recovery coaches? Or? I will send that out as well. Okay. So what Ron is referring to for the recovery coaches we put together, essentially um, your, your local, like the two-on-ones, the give and get help guides, for example, all of those from all the counties in central Wisconsin, all in one place. So again, it's multiple pages, it's hugely comprehensive. If there's information that's inaccurate in there, you know, definitely let me know. We'll update as needed. But we did use existing resources. We didn't just come up with stuff on our own. So that may, may trigger if there's something that's not quite right to, to update it. But um, it is something that has been a work in progress. And Ginny, um, the, our intern uh, for the last few months, which I don't think this would be your first AOD partnership meeting. Because you started, I think, after our first one. So, or our first one this year. So... She's been here. She's been helping out with the Recovery Coaching Network. So it's been really great. Uh, we are looking at making this more sustainable and getting people trained as train the trainers. So we'll be able to do trainings more often here in Marathon County. There is a training coming up um, that has gone out through the update and will go up out again. So anybody that's interested in recovery coaching, becoming a recovery coach, uh, there's a training in Wisconsin Rapids. The cost would be $550. Excuse me. It's a four-day training from the 6th, I believe, through the 10th. Mosaic is open now? Mosaic is open now. When did it open? It opened April 2nd. Wow. Kind of a soft opening. We haven't been promoting it a ton, so now it's about a month in. They've been able to clean up what they wanted to clean up, and now they're just kind of working on it. So this is Jeff's page, or the page for Mosaic, which stands for Mending Oneself and Inspiring Change. Um, but it is something that 
we're we're just again it's it's something that the community's just needed for a long time. So we've had people reach out that are looking for recovery coaches that have been able to um, you know go down and meet with Jeff uh, and and just find out more about coaching. But you know it's it's really just a good feeling. They're looking at doing incorporating art within the location. Um, this is. Right now it's 9 to noon, but depending on uh, volunteer availability, uh, these hours will most likely change, which is why, you know, if you're on Facebook, I encourage you to, you know, like them on Facebook, and then you'll be able to get most of those updates. But that is, that was pretty pretty cool project, pretty cool initiative. In front of you, you have copies of the upcoming trainings. Uh, I did put them in order. It was kind of a rush. Um, on the right hand side where it has saved the date is the annual meeting and training which is going to be in Stevens Point June 21st and 22nd. Uh, it is going to be a very comprehensive learning opportunity. You're going, there's CEUs and credits that are going to be available um, to you if that's something that you need. It's very cost effective. It's uh, $50. I believe that the scholarships are, we're past the date for scholarships. However, uh, but it is $50. It is a, a pretty local training uh, for anybody that's interested in going. Um, I would recommend it. It's, it's usually a very, very good training. There is a pre-conference for anybody that's interested in learning more about ethics um, that is also available on that Wednesday. Uh, so that is another opportunity for you. There will be a drug identification for educational professionals training. Coming up, um, we don't have the exact date yet. Um, Melinda Paul, Officer or Lieutenant Melinda Pauls, and I'm not for sure who she's going to be co-presenting with. We'll be doing that in July. We're looking at doing that kind of in conjunction with the High and Plain Sight training, which is on the left side. Um, for those of you that have never heard Jermaine Galloway, he's phenomenal. He's a very interactive and very uh, exciting. He's a very good, very very good presenter. Um, this uh, training we're keeping at a very low cost. It's a two full day training with all the food refreshments, uh, materials, and everything that goes along with it. It's $125, or if you have three or more from one agency or organization, it's $100. So they can manage group rates. Um, so that kind of helps bring that cost down. But it is a uh, it is probably one of the best trainings I've ever been to, and everybody that's gone to it in the past has also expressed the same. He's, very, he's a very, very good presenter. So that's some of the upcoming trainings. Um, is there any other partner updates? Anybody else have anything to share? How are Big Brothers Big Sisters still looking for matches? Always. Always. Um, we're also expanding to Abbotsford and potentially Anago and Fall. We're taking that show on their own. Excellent. Excellent. Any other updates? No? Okay. Um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and move on to the program. What you have in front of you, and what's available, is uh, you have a copy of our latest report. I'm going to go over some of the highlights and kind of tee this up first. Um, and I'll probably wander over there and kind of point out some of the, the additional information that we have here. Because uh, you don't have everything. If you're interested in it, you could surely take it. But just to give you guys um, a little bit of background. So this, uh, the comprehensive assessment of the prevalence and perceptions of medication abuse, easy for me to say, is actually something that we've done since 2011. Uh, the first time that we did this assessment was a call survey. We worked with St. Norbert's for that particular one. And then since in 2013, 15, and 17, we've worked with UW River Falls. Um, but before I get into that, I just want to kind of start out with an overview of the problem, just with the, the title being, do we have a prescription drug problem? What does that actually mean? Um, so when you look at prescription drug abuse, you know, we're looking at specifically addictive behaviors. This isn't, I, I always like to differentiate between being physical de physically dependent on prescription opiates, for example, versus abusing them and, and addic being addicted to them. So when you look at f the physical dependence of prescription opiates, that person may show withdrawal symptoms if you, if you cut off those medications. Same things if you're on certain medications like benzodiazepines, like anxiety medications. These are medications, it's dangerous if you just cut 
yourself off. You could go into withdrawal. So um, when we look at prescription drug abuse, what I really mean um, is actually on a one-pager that's over there. I didn't hand it out, but we definitely can surely hand it out. Essentially, when you look at prescription drug abuse, it's using somebody else's medication that, that's not your own, uh, not taking them as prescribed. Uh, so if it says take two, you take four. Or just taking a prescription with the intention to get high. Um, you know, you're taking it because it makes you feel good. Um, so all those things kind of go together. Uh, but it, that's just kind of when we talk about, you know, medication misuse, that's really kind of what we're talking about is really taking, taking the medications as prescribed that are not for you or just in the, the intention to get high. Commonly abused medications, um, I'm just probably going to hand these out because it's just easier. So I'm going to move around, Dave. Sorry. I kind of lied to you. It's right here. So we'll just kind of pass these out. This actually lists commonly abused medications. There's extras too, so you can take extras if you want. Um, but typically, when you look at medications that are abused, they typically fall into three categories. Opioids, which are your prescription painkillers that are opiate based, um, whether they come specifically from an opiate plant or they are synthetically made like fentanyl. Um, the central nervous system depressants for anxiety or sleep disorders, you know, popular names like Xanax or Valium. And then you have your stimulants, which are for ADHD or um, dietary aids, for example, being Ritalin, Concerta, Adderall, Dex Dexedrine. Um, so there is a lot of medications out there. And if somebody is looking to abuse medications, they're going to know what they're looking for. I say that kind of with a little star next to it because I've actually heard uh, youth talk about that they just used whatever they could find. Um, where, you know, I actually had one, she was 15, she took five of her grandpa's Coumadin just to see what would happen. Coumadin's a blood thinner if you're not familiar. Um, extremely dangerous situation, but she really just did it because she wanted to see kind of what, what that might be. So I guess that's something that um, when we talk about medication abuse, we really do kind of look at these. And really the moral of the story is you never know if somebody's looking to abuse. Um, I actually have, both my sister and my mom have uh, fallen uh, victim to having somebody stealing their medications. One's at my niece's second birthday. At, my sister just had another knee surgery. Somebody took the time to go into her medicine cabinet and find her pain pills, took half the bottle. All family members and friends. My mom just recently actually had uh, some work done on the house. I believe they were fixing a furnace. And there is people in their house all week, and, you know, there's just some signs that some, this person, you know, they always use this bathroom instead of the one that is kind of more like a guest bathroom and just kind of suspicious things. And here she went, and uh, she just had knee replacement, and she went to go, and here somebody took her bottle of pills. She just had it refilled. So she's thinking... I'm going to go in and they're going to think I'm abusing my medications. I can't get more medication. She calls law enforcement. So again, you never know who's looking to abuse. So there's many reasons to, if you're not taking those medications uh, currently, to get them out of your house. Um, using our medication drop box program, which I'll kind of go over kind of how, the popularity of that and the rebrand here in just a little bit. But, you know, we use that free service to protect our environment so it doesn't end up in the groundwater to protect our public safety so then you don't have you know instances like my family's gone through and then you know, really to to protect our public health because you know kids pets anybody that gets their hands on these medications that it's not intended for them could be pretty dangerous so you know we talk about this again too because Nash on a national level and that brings me back to the YRBS reports that are over there on a national level, um, you know, medications are the third most commonly abused drug next to alcohol and marijuana. So it is something that's being abused, and there's so many that, you know, you just turn on the TV and there's more prescription drug ads than there is uh, medication, or excuse me, beer ads these days. But when you look at the, the YRBS, it is lower uh, than the national and state averages. Um, and if you go to actually Healthy Marathon County Pulse, um, you'll actually be able to see some of the data related to that in the Health Marathon County Pulse is on the back side of your agenda. Uh, but when you look at the national averages and the state averages, our 30-day use rates uh, in 2017 were 6% of high school, which was up actually from 4.3% in 2015. And then if they've ever, that's 30-day, and if they've ever 
use medications that are not, were not prescribed to them. High school rates are actually 11%. So that's one out of 10 kids have abused medic or used medications at some point in their life not prescribed to them, which is up again from 8.4. So it's a trend that's going up. Um, it is uh, something that you know, we're kind of paying attention to. And when you look at the middle school data, which is we have new data, uh, it's the first time we ever collected that and shared that, that aggregate actually had 3.5% in 2017. So there's really not that much, that's, that increase is pretty, pretty significant, but there's still quite a bit of kids already that this is something that's readily available to them. So as I said, you know, this medication assessment is the fourth of its kind. Um, it's actually a very unique survey. We, we created it from national uh, data questions to make sure our questions were pretty consistent. And uh, those that we worked with to implement the survey reviewed them to make sure they were still accurate. Um, it was our way to be able to track trends on prevalence of abuse, perception of risk, perception availability, as well as um, the diversion or disposal efforts because we wanted to know if people knew where to take their medications or where they took them or how they got rid of them as well as if they knew where to, to drop them off. So that, that's that been the same all along. The survey's been the same all along. Over there, there's actually copies of the survey questions. Uh, so if you're interested to know what those survey exact survey questions are. Um, and I'm guessing that these stacks might have kind of piled up. Here is, yeah, there's questions in the survey. This we can pass out too. This is actually, I just, you have the front page. The whole, sur the whole um, report is about 60 pages long. So what you have here is the cover, because <laughs> I wanted you to know what you're getting, um, as well as kind of the executive summary and narrative form, so you get a little bit more of the data uh, behind it. So I'll let those get passed over. And then the final page is actually like their conclusion, their bulleted conclusions pages. So the process for this assessment has been the same also, um, besides the first one being a phone survey and then the last three being a written uh, mailed survey. This year was the first time we were able to collect uh, data from non-metro respondents, non-metro being Anybody that falls outside of 544103, which are WASA, 54474, 54476, which cover Weston, Schofield, and Rothschild, and Remountain. So Remountain is actually 54401. So we were able to collect from areas like Edgar, Marathon, Ringel, um, Spencer, Stratford, you know, Abbotsford, really the whole county was able to kind of contribute into this report. Um, majority of the data that is in front of you really does reflect on the metro area specifically because that's what we've been collecting, but we're able to make some comparisons overall. In this summary report is specific to the metro area, however, um, but I would have to say our rates of return for a mail survey is really, I thought, quite impressive. Uh, the mail survey went out to 1,900 people in the metro area and 1,000 outside of the metro area. They actually were very intentional in oversampling 35 and younger because a lot of the times when you do these kind of assessments, you don't have that population surveyed very well. Um, but we actually had a return of almost 400 in the metro of that 1900 and over 300 in the non-metro. So very good samples um, for a survey that there's no incentive, except this is just information that we want. Um, so we were pretty impressed with what came back. But just to kind of walk through it, a little bit. Um, like I said, the whole report you do have online. And just to kind of give you the highlights, to stay consistent with other surveys in the area like the life report or some other behavioral surveys, the first question that I always like to point out, which is why it's the first question and how concerned are you about uh, health in Marathon County is, you know, you look at, so I refer you to the inside corner of your report. Um, you look at how concerned people are about different health issues. Health issues such as smoking or alcohol or obesity, we haven't seen very much movement on. People recognize there's a problem there, but you know, you haven't seen this really significant increase as if you look, kind of look at the illegal drug use and the prescription drug use, you have. You know, people are much more concerned about illegal drug use, methamphetamines, heroin, cocaine, you know, all of those, those are really our big three, by the way. We, I can't say that opiates is our big problem. 
I can't say meth is only our big problem. It's really those three uh, put together as far as illicit drug use goes. But you can see how that continues to increase. And I'm really proud to say that I think some of that has to do with the great work you know, that AOD Partnership and our partners have been doing to talk about these issues and keep them in the public eye. Um, and also when we look at our data too, you know, these are not issues that are just kind of sensationalized by media. The data through uh, law enforcement and through uh, the district attorney's office has continued to increase, um, especially methamphetamines. It's the only one that has gone up consecutively every single year. So when we look at that level of concern, you know, one of the things you'll see here is that prevalence of abuse. Um, and, you know, we just don't have it. In our data, I'm saying, we just don't have it. We don't have people that regularly admit, and that's in the, the printed copy that was in front of you, that will admit that they've, they've used. That's why it's not included in this report. Because it's not, I mean, I don't want to say it's not impressive, but it's not anything that has really changed. We have majority of the people, over 9 out of 10 people, do not abuse or use medications not as prescribed to them. So we do a good job. Um, compared to, if you remember, I think it was last year, Last year, there was a survey that was out there that said that WASA was in the top 25 of medication abuse in the entire nation. Um, so there's a little bit of conflicting there, but I think what you'll see here is when you look at perceptions of availability and the perceptions of risk, just kind of how that might play into underreporting of this particular issue. Because not everybody realizes if you take medication, you know, you had leftover antibiotics and you give it to somebody else, that is a form of medication abuse. So perceptions of prescription availability, you, we actually were very intentional in looking at where is it that people feel that they're getting medications from in order to abuse them. I think a lot of the times we blame doctors or prescribers, which while I'm not saying that they're not a part of this, I'm not saying the drug company is not a part of this, um, but when we really look at it, more people, right along the national average, about three out of four people feel that if somebody's going to abuse medications, they're getting them from family members or friends. That has not changed. You can see in the rates here um, that, that that is something that continues to be consistent. Um, you look at charts 12, 13, and 14 um, that are included in the report that people do not necessarily feel that medications are easily available. I think that has a lot to do with more people getting them out of their home. I think that has a lot more for people securing and monitoring them. Um, but I also think it's, there is a, a change in culture around the um, disposal, or excuse me, in the writing, both disposal and the writing of prescriptions, because you have places like uh, Bone and Joint Pain Clinic, for example, that that is not your first option. You have places like Advanced Pain Management that have changed how they look at prescribing. Um, so while there was this huge jump, you know, I think that people are really looking at how they prescribe and make those available differently. So if you have any questions, just feel free to toss them out at me. Um, you'll see some differences between ages, how these things are perceived, between genders, uh, between metro and non-metro in the written report that you guys all have. Um, you know, but when you look at that perception of risk, I think people do understand that there's some risk with taking medications not as prescribed. Um, I think that people recognize that this is uh, something that could be very dangerous, especially when you see now um, the instances of people making counterfeit pills, uh, which is what they, they suspect happened to Prince, is that he thought he was getting one thing and actually was a counterfeit medication. Um, it's not hard to do, especially if you, know, you could buy the presses right online, and if it had a one on it, you can get the stamp and stamp it yourself. Um, and it could be mixed with other things. So, you know, that perception of risk is... You know, whether it's safer than you could see in 7 out of 10 people feel that or strongly disagree or disagree that it's safer to use prescription drugs versus street drugs. I think the message is out there that these things can be dangerous. So again, not just prescription opiates. You're looking at benzodiazepines as well, which is another very, you know, when you look at muscle relaxers or sleep uh, agents, those actually can be um, very dangerous, especially when they're linked with other depressants like alcohol. Um, so, 
again, that perceived risk is something that we continue to look at. I think what I'm most impressed with, and I'll share with you uh, some of the, the information on the rebrand of our medication drop box program, is the number of people that know where our drop boxes are and that they use them. That was one of those data points we wanted to make sure was early on into the report. Um, so if you look at the differences between um, how many, one, it was about half the pe half respondents take medications for a chronic disease um, on a daily basis. So you're looking at a big number of people that took this survey are, are regularly taking medications. It's about 56% in this last one. But when you look at how many people who have expired medications in their home, what I was kind of pleased about is at the last one in 2015, I was just like, seriously? We have this many people holding on expired medications, why? And this isn't even asking about unwanted medications that maybe you got you know, 30 days of prescription painkillers, you took one, it made you itch, like it does to me. I would not be a very good opiate abuser. Um, it take, you take one and you hold on to it just in case that you know, more people are, are now not holding on to those expired medications. Is it because we have less people taking medications or getting medications? Perhaps, but that was one of those differences between the, the 2015 and 2017 report where when I was looking at the 2015 report, we had almost 40% of people say they had expired medications in their home. At the summary of that report, as well as this report, we have more people than ever concerned about medication abuse. You know, when people ask, like I already said, we, had, we asked people whether or not, or where they think people get medications of abuse to use, that they get them from family members or friends, but we held on to medications longer. It was just kind of counterintuitive and counterproductive you know, to what it is that we were trying to do. So I was very excited to, to see you know, just how many people know where the drop boxes are. You know, three out of four people know where they are. That is their main, you know, almost half of those folks, that's where they take their medications uh, when they need to dispose of them. Uh, so there, there is a, a really good momentum in our drop box program, but what we found, which is kind of a segue from the report to uh, you know, just kind of looking at what we're doing with this rebrand is what we found is that we needed to re, just kind of revive it because it wasn't very exciting. So with that revision, if I was ahead, I would get this to you. Okay, I'm just going to go the long way around. With this revision, we actually... Uh, AOD Partnership partnered with uh, Solid Waste, Marathon County Solid Waste, and Morty and the Makers, which is a, a local marketing firm, to come up with some a rebrand to look at the medication job box program because honestly, the old handouts, if you saw them, they're nothing fancy. I take credit for doing them and I say they're boring. But we wanted people to really not just know where they are, but actually move them to do something about it. So we uh, created a series of PSAs, which I didn't check the volume. So hopefully we don't get blasted here, if it loads. Um, we took a series of PSAs. They have long great days ahead of them. This can change in a heartbeat if they get their hands on your medication. Protect tomorrow today by getting rid of unused and expired medications safely. For the medication drop-off there is due, go to MarathonCountySolidWaste.org. So there's that one, and then protecting the environment. We'll also have a protect public safety one coming up to be released. Fit loads. I invite you to share these as well. have been found in lakes, rivers, and in the drinking water supplies of millions of Americans. Dispose of your unused and expired medications safely. For the medication drop box nearest you, go to MarathonCountySolidWaste.org. So that was actually, we were kind of excited about that rebrand because you can see on the back of your your reports, just kind of how that kind of drop box plays with the RX, which is kind of neat. With that rebrand, part of the excitement is that we actually launched our seventh permanent drop box. So what I have over here, I have like stacks, so if you want to take like some back to where your office, we have protecting the environment look, as well as the, um, the kids look. But I just, you know, encourage you to share that information. We continue to have 100% of our pharmacies uh, promote it. We're doing, uh, actively doing outreach to dental clinics and veterinary clinics. Uh, but this is something that can be promoted really anywhere, just so that people know that it exists. With that rebranding, 
we're just excited to add Spencer because now we have Marathon, Spencer, um, Colby Abbotsford that serve really in the western part of Marathon County as well as Cronenwetter and Rothschild that are 24-7 sites, Everest Metro and Wausau Police Departments as well. The reason that all of them within our Marathon County Job Box program are in police departments is because they need to be in a secure location um, and it makes most sense to be there. Uh, but I can tell you that we're, we're also happy to, to share with you that Marshfield Clinic Pharmacies, so if you go to a Marshfield Clinic Pharmacy, they have drop boxes in their location. So if you're going to pick up a medication there, you can drop, take your old medications with you right away and drop them off, as well as Walgreens on Bridge Street. Uh, Walgreens on a national level have started to install permanent drop boxes within their 24-7 Walgreens locations, and that would be the only one that we have here in Marathon County. So you have, ten, you know, that would be 10 places, 11 places, if you count all the Marshfield Clinics, uh, to be able to, you know, dispose of your meds. So there's really no reason to hold on to them any longer. I give you permission to take them out of your home, please. Uh, <laughs> And you know, with that Dropbox rebrand, um, besides getting that new information out there, um, they are going to be developing ways for you to share it within your social media, put banners on your pages. Um, it is something that, again, it's bigger than just people abusing medications. As you can see in the report, it's really about you know, how aware we are about how we can maybe be contributing inadvertently to you know, the issue as it is. And just to remind everybody, if you are looking to get rid of your medications, at those drop boxes, it's for residential use only. Um, so to keep that in mind, it's for home only. So, but if you're collecting a bunch for some reason within your organizations, um, the intent is not for you to take them there. Any pills that you have, empty them all out. You don't need to separate them. Put them all into one Ziploc type bag and take them to the drop box locations. Any creams or liquids like cough syrups, coating cough syrup, for example, uh, it seems like everybody has some of that laying around their house. Um, put in a bag as well because if you put them in the drop boxes and you don't have them in a bag, sometimes they leak and it just makes a mess. Uh, inhalers are also uh, able to be collected now. That's something that's new over the last couple years. Anything that's in a blister pack, like that you have to push through foil, you don't have to worry about pushing those out. You could just bring those in as is. And I think that was pretty much what's in. No needles and syringes uh, are allowed at the drop boxes. Um, personal care products, like when I say p tell people to clean out their medicine cabinets, they literally do. We get like Band-Aids and lotion and chapstick and okay. that kind of stuff we do not absolutely, you know, we don't want in our drop boxes. Um, those things can be disposed of safely. Uh, vitamins and supplements as well. Uh, if you have any questions about what you're looking to take in there, I just invite you to call Marathon County Solid Waste, uh, visit, visit their website. Um, if you do have needles and syringes you're looking at getting rid of, on that website you'll find a link also for the DNR. They have all the registered sites. So there's some pharmacies that take back those um, and healthcare systems that also take back. So, or you can talk to Marathon County Solid Waste as well and they charge you just a small fee and it's by weight. So um, if you are looking to dispose of those within your own home, um, if you do have needles that you're looking to get rid of, using things like the heavy Tide or Downy, you know, the heavy plastic containers, not milk cartons because milk cartons are too thin, but use those heavy containers and you can safely put them in there and then bring them into one of those recycling places. Or you can actually get little clippers, they look like dog clippers in my mind, to clip the ends off the needles um, so then the, the syringe itself is safe. Um, and then the needles go into its own little container. So with that, I think I'm going to stop talking for just a minute. Yes, Ginny? Do you have, uh, how about um, over-the-counter medication? Over-the-counter medications? Medication I would say, you know, old aspirin, Tylenol, ibuprofen, stuff like that, um, you could dispose of in the, right away, in the, right in the trash. Uh, medications that have dexamethorphan in them, which is, or DXM, it's a cough medicine, very popular cough medicine, that can be abused. Uh, if somebody's looking to, you know, abuse those, you know, I've, I've also, Imodium, I mean, there are some things that are concerned. If you do have any questions, better safe than sorry, take it there, we'll take it, we'll get rid of it. Um, but, you know, if you do have any specific questions about those medications, you can call the solid waste number. Good question. Any other questions about the report, uh, the drop boxes, our local drop boxes, or the new rebrand, and how you can get involved with that? Yes. The drop box at Walgreens within next to the pharmacy. Yep. 
it's right next to the pharmacy. It's kind of where if you've gone to the one on bridge where they had all the insulin materials. So it's like you have check, check in, check out, consultation. It's like right there. So it's just another option. And, and quite a, I think the more options we have, the better. Okay, so I have to pull up Johnny's presentation. But I'm going to invite Johnny up here to introduce himself. Sure. Please. And our presents here. So Yay. I see you have a whole table full of them. Sorry, yes. Feel free to grab some. Um, grab many. Leave. I don't want to take this back with me. So. Um, good morning. It is still morning, right? No, it's afternoon now. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Johnny Cormanis. I'm the Director of Communications and Public Affairs at the Wisconsin Department of Justice. I serve uh, under Attorney General Brad Schimmel. Um, Melissa and I have worked a number of times in a number of different projects and at events and have been at a bunch of different meetings together. So um, I appreciate the invite to, to come up here and to, to be with you all today. So um, today I will be giving you an overview of what we call uh, the dose of reality. Have many of you heard of the dose of reality? No? Yes, a couple? All right, that's good, that's good. So our, our uh, tactics are working. In 2015, when Attorney General Schimmel became Attorney General, um, he wanted to do something about the um, prescription drug and, and heroin abuse epidemic going on in the state of Wisconsin. He was a DA for 25 years um, in Waukesha County, outside of Milwaukee and uh, we're seeing a lot of um, heroin showing up in suburban communities and, and realize that something you know, is going awry. So he, um, and this, again, this is going back 15 um, years or so, so he worked with uh, local law enforcement um, and you know, that was really kind of the, the, the start of the, the heroin epidemic in that part of the state and realizing um, about prescription opioids being the, the gateway. So A.G. Schimmel was really kind of a leader amongst the district attorneys and uh, law enforcement in Wisconsin. And so when he came into office, he knew that this was a, a, had to be a huge priority and focusing on the prescription drug side of it um, would help on the heroin uh, end because we know roughly four out of five heroin users started with prescription uh, opioids. So if we can stamp out the prescription opioid abuse, we would never um, have to deal with uh, heroin on the scale that we have. So we launched the Dose of Reality um, in September of 2015. Um, it's a, um, an advertising campaign, a public awareness campaign targeted. Um, it, we started targeting young adults, um, and those uh, who influence young adults, so generally parents um, of young adults. So that was our target audience. Uh, the campaign in the last few years has grown to include a lot of other audiences. So we now have uh, outreach materials and educational materials for senior citizens, those who work in HR and management, if they suspect they have somebody um, on their team who might be struggling with um, addiction. Um, we're going to be launching toward the end of May uh, a suite of materials uh, geared toward veterans. Uh, we've been working with the Department of Veterans Affairs and the VA um, hospitals across the state on that. So um, I'd, I'd like to recognize briefly some of the partners that we have um, in the Dose of Reality. These are organizations um, that have um, sat down with us, uh, lent their subject matter expertise um, in some cases, some of these organizations have actually contributed financially um, to, to the operation, such as the Wisconsin Department of uh, Health Services. Um, and then a lot of these other organizations, these partner organizations that represent folks in the medical community, um, those, those individuals have um, promoted, actively promoted our materials, perhaps in a doctor's office or um, in a hospital. Um, a lot of times you'll find different um, educational materials in their uh, monthly, weekly publications, whether in print or uh, via email. So these, these folks have, have been a key part of getting the message across. Um, we, we wanted to make sure that uh, in addition to getting in touch with young adults and parents, that we're also targeting those who have the ability to write uh, scripts for them prescription drugs. So that's why these partnerships with these medical organizations um, was, was so important. And, uh, and we feel that there has been a, a change um, in a lot of ways 
um, in the way that prescribing has been done. Some of that obviously is due to new prescription guidelines um, that were passed recently. Some of it's due to uh, a mandated prescription drug monitoring program uh, usage. Um, but, but also we've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence that the um, message is really penetrating uh, within the prescribing community. Uh, the AG, for example, his own uh, dentist uh, told him that he read um, about uh, the dangers of, of opioid prescribing in the Dental Association um, quarterly magazine. And it led him to do more research, and now he uses non-opioid um, alternatives for treating pain in his, in his clinic. So great news across the board, but obviously still a lot of work uh, left to do. Um, so as I mentioned, these are some of the um, um, organiz or some of the um, audiences that we uh, have targeted. Um, and again, each audience has specific materials um, geared toward that office, everything from the imagery to the actual language. Um, all the materials are free to use. And if you um, uh, go, you, c you can click each of these as individual um, uh, outreach materials. If you go to the program materials uh, button up in the top right corner, it'll take you to a page um, like this, and as you can see right here, online ordering portal. Um, it'll take you here where you'll log, you'll be asked to uh, request a login. We only do this so we know who is using the materials. Um, there's no fee, there's, um, um, there's nothing in, involved other than just handing over um, you know, who you are, and so that way we can track the materials. And um, because we're tracking it, we know that there have been uh, uh, about 500 different organizations throughout the state of Wisconsin that have um, downloaded these materials and, and used them. And that, that ranges anywhere from um, hospitals to doctor's offices to dentist's offices to churches to schools um, and everything in between. So there's, there's no limit on who can use this. Um, you know, we certainly, if, if there's a parent out there that wants to um, have a conversation with their children and, and wants to use the materials as kind of a guide, um, there's nothing barring a private individual from um, requesting um, access to the ordering portal. Um, when you go on, it's kind of like an online store, and uh, all the materials are, are listed um, like, like what you see here in this example. Um, and you can either download the, the generic uh, version of it, or you can download a version to um, customize where you can work yourself, or if you, um, some organizations have graphic design folks who might want to customize it slightly, maybe add in a logo, um, we allow that to take place. Or if you don't have that type of resource available to you, um, we're willing to, to do that. Um, we want this to be a partnership, we want buy-in from the community, we want buy-in from our partner organizations. So um, co-branding is a, is a great way uh, to do that. Um, here's an example of, of what a, uh, one of the brochures look, looks like. So a lot of the materials uh, kind of approach it um, as if the audience has a, a very minimal understanding of opioid abuse. So we go through a lot of the, the basics on here um, and then have some kind of guidelines um, for uh, what to do and what not to do related to uh, prescription opioids. And then we go after myths and, um, and, and distort, um, uh, distortions surrounding um, opioid abuse. Here are some of the flyers that we have available. Um, the one on the left is uh, targeted at drug disposal, which I heard you just talking about beforehand. Um, the state coordinates um, through DOJ um, in partnership with the Department of Natural Resources and DHS. Um, we coordinate uh, statewide prescription drug take back day, which was on Saturday, as you probably all know. So today, actually, um, all of the drugs are being um, shipped down to a central uh, processing facility in Waukesha County um, where they'll be boxed up, packaged up, put on pallets, shrink wrapped, loaded onto semi trucks, and then later this week it'll be transported down to uh, Covanta uh, Energy in Indianapolis. Um, they're an energy uh, producer that um, burns uh, garbage uh, throughout the region and they uh, do it for free for us. Folks often ask why we go all the way to Indianapolis. Um, the answer is there are only a few facilities in Wisconsin that meet the standards needed to dispose of prescription drugs and unfortunately they charge a few dollars per pound. 
So when you're disposing of, of huge amounts, and I have the, the recent numbers um, listed here. Um, oh, I skipped back. Um, yeah, more more of the more of the um, posters here. Um, but when you're disposing of um, the amounts that we're disposing of, you know, 34,000 pounds going back to September 14, all the way to um, the most recent one where we disposed of 63,941 pounds statewide, you know, that gets a little bit pricey if you're paying a few dollars per pound. So there's a facility that's doing it, willing to do it for free. We've taken them up on that for the last two years. Um, we've also made it a, um, an effort um, via the business community to get involved. We've had um, the trucks donated in the past. We've had boxes donated in the past, plastic wrap donated in the past. So um, it's a really great way for um, organizations to, to engage with us and um, take some uh, ownership. Um, this, uh, this year we're expecting we'll probably beat this uh, 63,000 uh, uh, pound. Um, this is actually not the record though. One, um, last April, 66,000 pounds. That's the record so far and we're expecting we'll exceed that because we've gotten more law enforcement agencies online, um, not actually online, um, but we've gotten more law enforcement organizations involved in it, have gotten them um, permanent prescription drug disposal boxes in their law enforcement agencies throughout the state. Um, I'll go back to this slide here. You can see this is actually um, outdated. Now if you go to the website and look at the interactive map, you'll see little orange pins all over the state. It's, it's really um, amazing to see the progress that we've had um, in recent years. Um, I mean, going back to May of 15, there were only 194 registered law enforcement agencies. Um, for this drug take back day, we have more than 300. So just in the last two years, we've, um, uh, three years, we've gotten um, another 100 plus uh, law enforcement organizations on board with us. Um, the um, hospitals and other um, non-law enforcement entities that have drug disposal boxes, um, those folks do not um, send us their unused drugs and medications. Um, per DEA rules, we're only allowed to dispose of the drugs that are collected by law enforcement agencies. Um, that being said, though, um, on our website, on the interactive map, any organization that has a drug disposal box, we list it on our website. Um, if we know about it or if somebody contacts us and asks us to list it on the website, we absolutely do. We want to make it as easy as possible for people to dispose of their unused medications so they can go to the um, website, they can uh, enter their zip code, um, click search, and then it will bring up a, a population of um, local drop boxes uh, along with hours and contact information and things like that. Um, to, to really a, a big undertaking and um, it has its challenges. I heard over the weekend um, from an individual who went to a, um, a drug drop box at a law enforcement agency in a municipality next to the one where this lady lived and they turned her away. Um, they asked for ID and they turned her away saying she didn't live in the community. So there's a certain level of, of education outreach that needs to be done and, and we work pretty tirelessly on that at, at that as well. Um, but again, there's been a huge progression in recent years as far as knowledge of these and, and making drug disposal kind of a regular uh, occurrence for folks. So that's what it looks like. So today, this is, this is what folks are up to. Um, the, there are regional drop-off sites throughout the state. Um, so there's one uh, here in Wausau. Uh, State Patrol helps out, um, and then uh, one of our DCI agents um, puts the boxes on uh, a U-Haul and then sends them down to this facility in Waukesha County, again, where they're processed, and then loaded up onto, onto trucks. So um, that's, uh, that's kind of all I have. I, I would love to hear any questions that you have about the materials, about ways to engage with DOJ um, in other capacities, whether it's drug disposal or it's education and outreach. But... Um, um, or if you have feedback on anything I, I showed you and think that's something stupid and we should change the way we're doing it, I'm always happy to, to take that kind of feedback as well. Oh. Great. Uh, oh, no. That's pretty cool. Okay. Okay. We, you know, one thing too I failed to mention, um, along with the uh, various materials over here, like I said, feel free to take them, specifically things like 
drug disposal magnets that give instructions on um, what to dispose of, what not to, and then with a link to, um, to the website so you can find the location, as well as drug disposal bags with the same kind of information on them. Um, but one thing I failed to mention in addition to all of this is that um, we have, over the past couple of years, spent money online um, through uh, TV, um, both cable and broadcast and radio. Um, we've had ads playing um, throughout the state. Um, and again, when you're online, your ability to kind of target your audience, um, it, it becomes a lot more uh, specific. So we're able to do specific outreach for, say, the tribal community, um, or, you know, again, young people, the elderly, um, those who work in, in business and, and HR. Um, so so we've, we've launched those ads. We're going to have another um, um, set of ads running uh, within the next couple of months. So it's, it's all about outreach. It's all about raising awareness. Um, and like I said, if you have any specific feedback or you think that we're missing something, if you have a chance to go to the website and look around and you think something should be changed, please feel free to, to call me or email me. Well, we want to make this the, the best outreach effort uh, possible. We want to make the best use of our resources as possible. And we ultimately want it to be a good resource for all of you who are out in the field dealing with this every day. So, yeah. So my mom um, had renters in her house and um, they kind of left in a hurry. Mm -hmm. And she, when she was cleaning out, somebody had left behind just like a shopping bag full of um, heart medication. Oh. Obviously, like a year supply, obviously they must not have needed it. <laughs> and so she was afraid of turning that in because it's got his name on all the sure. prescription bottles. Yeah, that's and that's all. That's that's always a danger. Um, I would, if she's still looking to dispose of it, I would recommend that she calls um, the local law enforcement agency through their non-emergency um, uh, line. But uh, call local law enforcement; they should be able to help her um, you know, deal with that process. Because I can understand what you're saying. She wouldn't want to show up with a bag of drugs and they think she's the one diverting them or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but DEA rules say you can dispose of. Um, your own drugs, um, or uh, I think it's an immediate family member. They're very specific who can who can do it, and I don't think that would qualify. So, um, calling law enforcement on the non-emergency line would probably be the best way to, to deal with that. Well, anything else you want me to touch on? Or? No, you know, I think what it comes down to is that you know there's a lot of materials out there. We have some stuff printed. We did get some stuff co-branded. This is awesome. I'd like to, can we order these on the website? I, I've got some more back at the office. I could just send some. Yes, send because some I'd things. actually like to have these put out at our locations. Yeah. So then people can dump their bottles right away. And, and we, we designed these actually in partnership with the um, Pharmacist Society. Um, so the idea was to get local pharmacists, when they hand somebody their script, they hand in one of these two and say, when you're done with it, you know, get rid of it in the proper way proper way. Okay. Yeah. I was like, well, that's fun. <laughs> but yeah, these materials are meant to, to take their, what we have here is just basic of how to identify prescription drug abuse, um, information for parents, we printed that one out. Um, we have information for um, employers, so if you want to share, if you want those, as well as just basic, you know, what patients should know about um, in a brochure form. So we did get some stuff co-branded. For that, like I said, there's a lot of materials up here. Um, and before we kind of close, uh, if you want to have a seat, okay, very good. I'm going to show you guys for our next AOD partnership meeting. So if we're good with medication abuse, I'm shifting gears. Mm -hmm. um, at our next AOD partnership meeting, we are going to be showing the follow-up. The follow-up to the. Paper Tigers documentary, which a lot of you guys have seen, um, called Resilience. And it's going to be part of a panel uh, discussion then following that. So I'm just going to share this. Um, pause. So it's, it's a very well-renowned video. I don't know. How many of you guys have seen Paper Tigers? Let's start there. So many of you. How many of you guys have seen Resilience? A couple? It's 
small handfuls? Okay. So this is just an opportunity to come view this uh, documentary in its entirety. And then, um, like I said, we're going to have a panel discussion afterwards as well. So I will be quiet and give you a teaser of this. We all like to think of childhood as this time of joy and innocence. But I mean, for many of us, it's just not true. When you grow up in these type of situations, it's not something you, you talk about. I know I did. The first thing that we found is that those childhood experiences are common. Anyway, well, the child may not remember, but the body remembers. There was this incredible achievement of that you need adverse childhood experiences cause heart disease and lung disease and liver and cancer. Exposure to trauma affects children's developing brains. Your behavior is on your heart. How do you how do you deal with all that? Don't reach out because they used to. We have a whole new body of knowledge now that could open up what we have until now been seen as intractable on some of our problems. No child can be punched or hit. No child can be punched or hit. If you can get the science into the hands of the general population. They will invent very wise actions. Do you feel like any of the interventions have been making a difference? They may all be different in the world. It's there, it's possible. And a defeatist attitude is completely disconnected from what 21st century science is telling us. And we should be going after them like a bear. So that is what will be featured at our AOD partnership meeting coming up here in June, on June 5th. So if there is any other questions, you guys get out to enjoy this weather a little bit early. Uh, please feel free to fill out your evaluation. Please come up and take materials of all this stuff over there. Um, take as many as you would like. Please help share and spread the word. Um, that's it. Got nothing else.